we've known because it keeps coming up again and again as well especially because people have been talking so much about it ever since the standoff with china uh, this entire you know topic of uh, prime minister nehru's miscalculation when it came to china you deal with it as well but what is the it's an issue which has been talked about so much what was your objective when you started writing about this thing uh, well sunetra my objective really was to inform uh, a young generation of indians about the very nuanced and complex nature of this entire narrative Uh, because it's very uh, interesting and very obvious that with the benefit of hindsight that everybody has 2020 vision but what i tried to demonstrate through writing this book is that hindsight is never you know fully accurate and you have to place yourself in the context of those developments those events and uh, what the leaders and what the policy makers were faced with the kind of challenges they were faced with when making these decisions so i've tried to offer a more nuanced narrative and i've also tried to underline that while you know it's usually the textbook gospel of many to blame nehru for everything that went wrong with china i've tried to say that you know it was not as if nehru was not aware of the dangers and the risks and the pitfalls of uh, of uh, dealing with this big neighbor next door this big neighbor that had come up against us in the himalayas as you know when the chinese entered tibet it was famously said by one of our officials who was posted in lhasa sumul sinha that the chinese have entered tibet and the himalayas no longer exist i think to some extent nehru was also aware of that he was aware that the basic challenge that runs across the spine of asia is the challenge between india and china and he said as much when he met an indian delegation that was going to china in 1952 when he had a briefing meeting with them so he understood the nature of the challenge but at the same time i think he was also quite um, focused on the need for a peaceful environment in which india could develop and india could consolidate its neighborhood and therefore he felt that friendship with china that uh, dialogue with china that's that some kind of understanding with china uh, here you would have these two big countries the big two of asia working together and that there could be a third force in world politics and that would redound to india's benefit now as it turned out he was uh, he was proved uh, wrong in his calculations about china but i'd like i tried to emphasize in the book that he was concerned about security along india's frontiers and he really was the one who uh, took the decisions to consolidate our administration closer to to the himalayan borders extend connectivity improve infrastructure so uh, blaming nehru may not entirely uh, solve the problem for us so at least uh, put us at ease in understanding what happened it's fascinating how so many people keep referring to china as you know and talk about the mind games some people refer to the thinking in china as cunning how much of that is particular only to china or is it true of negotiating any kind of tricky diplomatic relationship well in any negotiation i think each side has to understand the other comprehensively uh, you have to anticipate the kind of positions that the other side is going to take you have to be very clear about what your bottom line is you have to be uh, totally uh, lucid about you know what you can give up and what you cannot give up i think that applies to any any set of dip- diplomatic negotiations whether it's the chinese or whether it's any other country so yes you're right about that when it comes to diplomacy negotiation is an art uh, even more than a science and that uh, one has to understand one's op- opponent 
perfectly in order to be able to master a negotiation and to come to conclusions that safeguard your interest. How would you term the talks that have been happening? There are 13th round of talks that are happening. Do you feel that things are moving somewhere or is it yet again an instance of um, things being horribly misread? Well, I don't believe we're misreading the Chinese now. We've dealt with them for over seven decades. Many lessons have been learned. Many conclusions have been drawn. And I think we understand the terrain so much better. We understand the contours of the problem uh, so much more clearly. So I don't believe uh, we're losing ground on that front uh, any longer. Uh, the fact is that uh, we have a terribly complex a territorial dispute with China. It's the longest standing land border dispute, I think, anywhere in the world. It's that anyway, uh, in terms of the territory involved, it's the, one of the largest disputes you can think of at this point of time. Now, what has happened along the line of actual control in Eastern Ladakh and in some other areas of the border is that the Chinese have become so, so much more active, so much more assertive, so much more aggressive, if I may use the word. And uh, that uh, has entailed uh, a drastic change in the situation along the line of actual control for India. Tensions have arisen. And most importantly, the mechanisms and the regimes and the arrangements and agreements that we had for maintaining peace and tranquility and to build confidence between the two sides have essentially broken down, which is extremely unfortunate. So uh, India is on the right track in trying to seek through uh, patient negotiation, de-escalation and disengagement so that the situation along the line of actual control can revert to normal so that the status quo can be restored. So we are on the right track, but it's proving complex, it's proving protracted, and it's proving very complicated. But uh, obviously, what is the choice? I mean, wars, as I said in my book, are imperfect chisels in which to carve out peaceful tomorrows. I quoted Martin Luther King, and I think a war is an imperfect chisel, and it's not going to be able to solve anything for us. So there is no choice but to continue uh, to seek de-escalation and to arrive at some degree of disengagement so that we are able to reduce tensions in this, in this area. But don't you forget, there is an underlying territorial border dispute between the two countries. And unless or until we're able to solve it, uh, you know, we will not have a permanent lasting solution to these problems. In the coming few years, and especially with the kind of realignment that we're seeing, especially with the Biden administration, um, that this kind of antagonism, or at least this competition is here to stay. Yes, I think, uh, you know, uh, with a lot of for a lot of countries, I think the rise and emergence of China, the way China is straddling the global stage today, uh, the kind of reverberations that are being felt all around and their, you know, reverberations that are tending to be uh, causing a lot of turbulence in the environment. I think for a lot of countries, uh, we have to not only understand what the implications of the rise of China, what the emergence of China should mean for us. It's also a time, I believe, to develop uh, new alignments, new coalitions of the willing, as it's called, and new uh, patterns and habits of cooperation with many other of our partners, particularly our democratic partners uh, in the region and in other parts of the world. Uh, so this is really a time uh, for much more creativity, much more, uh, much less risk aversion, I would say, when it comes to developing new coalitions and new alignments. Uh, so for India, particularly, because we are we, we do live in a very difficult neighborhood today.